Shalom, good evening. Okay, here you go. Chag Sameach. Oh, you guys are well ahead. You know, that's, that's not fair. Well, do you know what it means? <laughs> uh, well, don't push it, right? So it, it means happy holidays, happy festival. Sameach means happy, and Chag means the festival. And so uh, most of you realize that we're just sort of on the uh, sort of the back nine of the uh, high holiday season. And this is uh, sort of, for Messianic Jews, this is like the, like the Easter season, you know, Christmas season. And so this is, uh, I think chosen people probably had hundreds of services over the last couple of weeks in our countries around the world and, and so on, and in the United States. And we probably had more Jewish seekers come during this time of the year than we'll have at any other time except for Passover where we eat, you know. <laughs> and so it's, it's been a really incredibly fruitful, wonderful, busy season. And uh, I look forward to it every year. And I just said no to a speaking engagement. Uh, somebody in, in Southern California, again, I like coming from Brooklyn to Southern California. I like going away from Brooklyn anywhere, really. But, <laughs> but I, I, I said no, uh, push it to the next week if possible because uh, every year for my entire life, my family gathers on the first night of Rosh Hashanah, the new year, for a family dinner. And it's as important to us as a Passover Seder. And, and it's one of the most important things about my testimony. I want to be able to tell my family, you can be Jewish and believe in Yeshua, Jesus. I am still Jewish, so I have to act Jewish, which means I have to show up for Rosh Hashanah dinner, <laughs> which is not hard work. So, uh, but no conflict today. Uh, Sukkot, uh, really this is the second day of Sukkot, and so it lasts for a week, but it's an extended holiday, as we'll learn, because there are a lot of different parts of Sukkot or tabernacles, uh, because we add an eighth day, which is actually in the Bible, and then we add a ninth day, which is not in the Bible, and the ninth day we call Simchat Torah. Now, you know what Simcha is, right? Joy. And Torah, that's easy. It's the law, right? And so it's the joy of the law day. And uh, the reason why it's the joy of the law day uh, is because we finish reading the law. <laughs> we finish reading the Torah, which takes all year. And so on Simchas Torah, we finish reading the Torah, and then we begin again from Genesis chapter 1. And so, as you probably understand, in the synagogue every Sabbath, we read from the Torah, and then we read a portion of the writings and the prophets, and we do it in pretty much 52 portions for the five books of Moses. And that way, every year, Jewish people have gone through the, those that attend synagogue, uh, uh, we, we've gone through the entire uh, old uh, uh, law, not, not everything else. Now, I'm going to uh, use a PowerPoint tonight, uh, but that doesn't excuse anybody from, not, from opening their Bibles, okay? So take out your phones and open to, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm always sitting there looking at my phone, you know, during the worship service. And I think people think I'm doing my email, but okay, once in a while I'm texting, but mostly, <laughs> mostly, mostly reading the Bible. Okay, so open your Bibles to your favorite passage, of course, Leviticus chapter 23. That's L-E-V-I-T-I-C-U-S. And so Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, and it's a marvelous chapter because uh, in Leviticus chapter 23, uh, we really have uh, all of the, well, you can, almost, you can see it. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 23, we have all of the seven major festivals of the Jewish people revealed. It, it was as if, Moses, after uh, he finished telling the Jewish people what to do and what not to do, and you all understand, according to Jewish tradition, there are 613 commandments of both positive and negative. 
And if you don't believe me, just go home and count. Now, I've never done it, but I'm sure that some of those are rabbinic, rabbinic injunctions. But uh, there are 613 do's and don'ts. But there's not just do's and don'ts in the five books of Moses. There's also a whole series of when's. Because when is as important to God as doing and not doing. And, it, and the devil's in the details, so to speak. It's very specific. And I once had a, a, a chosen people is a great group to work with because, you know, because we're Messianic Jews and, and therefore very confused you know, about our identities. Uh, so we get both the Christian and the Jewish holidays off. <laughs> Good? Okay, they're lining up. And uh, so, uh, it, well, we're, we're, our offices in Manhattan are right next door to a synagogue, so we look, you know, we're telling them we're Jewish and believe in Jesus, and we're open on Yom Kippur. That's not really a good idea. And so we closed down for the Jewish holidays, uh, the major days. And so one of our staff, Gentile believer, uh, said to me, you know, Mitch, this year uh, Yom Kippur is on a Saturday, and so we already have that off, so will we get you know, another day off to make up for, <laughs> said, you don't quite get this, okay? It's, we observe it when God says we should observe it. And so, uh, it's very important to take note of these whens, and uh, God is very specific uh, a God. Uh, and so, if you look at verse 1 of Leviticus 23, let's get a little feel for the festivals before we march towards the fall and look at Sukkot, tabernacles, in more detail. In Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, we read about the Sabbath. And the Sabbath becomes the model for all of the Jewish festivals. And it, of course, is a weekly festival. And certain things that are true of the Sabbath, what we t do on the Sabbath, is true of all the other festivals. So if you understand the, the Sabbath, it's the paradigm, it's the model for the other seven great annual festivals. All right? Everybody with me so far? Okay, some of you think I'm speaking in Hebrew. Okay, verse 1. So let me read it. The Lord spoke again to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord's appointed times, which you shall proclaim as holy convocations, my appointed times are... These And so God is about to give his holy and sacred appointment calendar to Moses to give to the Jewish people. And he begins with the once a week festival, the Sabbath. So look at verse 3. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. A holy convocation, don't do any work, it's a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. And so oftentimes the festivals of Israel look back on something God did in the past. Sometimes they're linked to the agricultural calendar, which was quite important to the Israelites since in those days, if they didn't follow it, you know, they had nothing to eat. And so, uh, it, but it, usually, it oftentimes will look back at a great event. And so the great event the Sabbath looks back to is creation. And God labored for six days and created the heavens and the earth, and he rested on the Sabbath. Now, how many of you believe that God rested because he was tired? <laughs> Have you thought about it? Okay, wh why did God rest? Well, we know at the end of the creation account, notice I didn't say story because I believe it's true. So at the end of the creation account, God took a look at uh, the man and woman he created and said, very good, very good. And so we were the punctuation of creation. Can you imagine? We're more beautiful than the most beautiful flowers that God ever created. We are very good. In Hebrew, tov ma'od, very good. And so God created the heavens and the earth, and then uh, he said it was great, perfect, uh, soon to be ruined, but... Uh, <laughs> It didn't take long, did it? <laughs> but at that moment, it was perfect. And, and so God rested. Now, you really have to be a musician to understand the rest part. OK? 
okay? You understand. So every musician knows that when you read a sh piece of music, there are rests along the way. Now, why do you have rests along the way? Well, if you're a singer, you know why you have rests along the way, so you can sneak a breath, okay? If you're a guitar player and you've been playing for a half an hour, you know why there's a rest there, because your fingers are killing you, okay? But really, the reason why there's a rest is to mark what's gone before and therefore giving new attention to what's coming ahead. And that's exactly what happened on the Sabbath. God rested and said, take a look. <laughs> it's great. And now we go on with the rest of our lives and Adam and Eve fell. So, but a rest, a time of reflection, pausing to look at what's been done and what's about to be done is an essential part of every one of these Jewish festivals, which I basically compare to retreats. When you go on a retreat, you get away, you gather, you learn, you congregate, and unless you're, you're a part of a Calvary chapel where they have Bible teaching incessantly all day and all night, you get a chance to play basketball or to rest, okay? And so that's what it's about. Now, you can see this played out in the first festival, which begins in the spring, which is the beginning of months for the Jewish people. Now, you do understand that the Jewish calendar, which I think we have some for sale, the Messianic Jewish calendar, first commercial announcement. <laughs> Get your calendar so you can keep it straight. You know that the, the Jewish calendar is based on lunar years. The pagan heathen calendar we follow is on solar years, okay? And, uh, and so uh, the, the, the holidays never fall out on the same days in, in our calendar. So, for example, my grandmother was born on the second day of Hanukkah. And so we celebrated my grandmother's birthday on a different day every year because <laughs> she didn't know what day she was born on in the normal calendar. She just knew what day she was born on in the Hebrew calendar. And so this is why the Jewish holidays change because uh, we're linking a solar calendar to a lunar calendar. And so no date is ever the same. So verse 5, we look at the first holiday. In the first month, not the second, not the third, on the 14th day of the month, not the 15th, at twilight, that Hebrew word means bet between the uh, evenings. So at twilight is the Lord's Passover. Then on the 15th day of the same month, there's a feast of unleavened bread for the Lord, to the Lord. For seven days you shall not eat leavened bread, unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread, which I wish was not in there because I'm the only Jew I know who hates matzah, <laughs> unless it's covered in chocolate. <laughs> I meet Gentiles who say, I love matzah. I say, good for you. <laughs> for me, it's a sacrifice, sacrificial season. So verse 7, on the first day you shall ho have a holy convocation. Okay, that's a gathering. Have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. That's the worship part of it. Because in the Old Testament, bringing the sacrifice to either the tabernacle or the temple, that was the heart of worship. Sacrifice was the heart of worship. And then you shall not do any laborious work. So no work, rest, congregate, worship, and then there's a few things you need to do to remember what happened. Number one, don't eat leavened bread. Why? Because the children of Israel were told by God that we had to leave Egypt so quickly we wouldn't have time for our bread to rise. To commemorate our haste in leaving Egypt, we eat unleavened bread. That's why we eat unleavened bread. But even in the Bible, in the Old Testament, and of course in the New Testament, and definitely in Jewish tradition throughout the years, 
unleavened bread took on a whole new meaning. It wasn't just the fact that we left in haste. It's that we, we understood that leaven is also a symbol of sin. It, did, it causes things to degenerate just like sin. And so today, when Jewish people do not, eat un, do not eat leavened bread and we eat unleavened bread, we think about purity. So every time I do not take a piece of regular bread, I think about repenting from my sin. And so it's a great discipline. I highly suggest uh, you try it. We won't think you're a legalist. We'll just think you're nuts for eating leaven for seven days. But it is, but it is a good spiritual experience. Listen, anytime you deny something yourself something you want is a good spiritual experience, right? So, can't go wrong. And so the Passover also looked back on a great event. It looked forward. It looked back to the day that God brought the Jewish people out of the land of Egypt. We're reminded of the sacrificial lamb whose blood was put on the lentil and doorposts of the house. God passed over and the firstborn males were saved. And then, of course, it didn't, just, it didn't end there. And then God took the children of Israel and walked us right through the Red Sea, and we stayed dry. And uh, then he gave it to Pharaoh, and, uh, and we were set free. And so the whole idea of redemption, freedom from bondage, is based on Passover. And so any time in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, you speak about freedom from bondage, whether it be to a evil boss or to a evil nation, but primarily from sin. We think of Passover. In fact, without Passover, we would never understand our salvation. It's freedom from the bondage of sin, a far more cruel taskmaster than Pharaoh. And so these holidays look back, and you know what? They actually look forward. Because the Sabbath always looks forward to that great kingdom Sabbath when God takes his world back, which is a Jewish concept too, and he reigns forever. And that will be the eternal Sabbath. So Jewish people are Religious Jews are all looking forward. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about that eternal Sabbath. When does it come? Well, when the Messiah comes. Everybody knows that. And is there a future for Passover? Every Jew knows that. Passover, we look back in order to look forward to the day when God will fully redeem us. And that means for Jewish people, picking us up out of torrents and bringing us right back to Jerusalem, to the Holy Land. So redemption means that we will be restored. So we look back at Passover to remember that one day we're going to be fully redeemed, which is why at the end of Passover, we sing the song, Lashana Haba Beirushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. It looks back to look forward. Now, I also believe that uh, that the Jewish festivals are what I call a roadmap to redemption. And the reason why they're a roadmap to redemption, and this is true even within Judaism, we understand that in some way these festivals look forward to a greater messianic redemption. And so these festivals become prophecies in as types looking forward to something greater so let me just lay it out there for you okay because we love the lord jesus and we believe he's the fulfillment of the festivals so i don't have to argue with you about that right Whew, good because in brooklyn you know it's kind of hard to get it's a little more difficult to get agreement on that point okay and stay alive. So, <laughs> so we understand that Passover was fulfilled in the Passover lamb. Yes. I mean, why in the world did God choose for Jesus to die on Passover? 
Second commercial announcement. <laughs> We've come out with a new book. <laughs> well, you thought I was kidding? Hey, listen, I got to sell this stuff or I, you know, I have a quote, I have qu Greg Denham gave me quotas. Okay, so, no, this is hot off the press, a new book called Messiah and the Passover. So this is everything you wanted to know and a whole lot more about Passover. And the best part is the recipes. <laughs> the recipes. So from soup to nuts, from Genesis all the way through your own personal Haggadah that you can use with your families. We have a website. You can download them for free. And then you can make all the foods and you can enjoy unleavened desserts like me. <laughs> Listen, you think that's funny. My birthday's in April. Half my life I have spent eating unleavened birthday cakes. <laughs> you don't know what misery is. <laughs> All right. So Passover, Passover looked forward to a future redemption which we understand was fulfilled in the death of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not only that, but unleavened bread was fulfilled in the life of Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah, because he was sinless, totally unleavened. He was a perfect sacrifice because he was fully man, fully God, but he never sinned. And because of that, he was able to bear our penalty, our sin, and he didn't have to die for his own sin. And so he is the ultimate unleavened. Now, I don't have time to go through the rest because we want to rush to the fall. And so after Passover and unleavened bread, we then have the Feast of First Fruits, which if you continue reading in Leviticus, we'll see that first fruit is supposed to take place on the, on the day after the Sabbath. The problem is the Bible never tells us which Sabbath. <laughs> and so there's tons of rabbinic discussion, so let me cut through it. The general position in Judaism, which you should just accept, the current, the, the, the position within Judaism is that it is, the, it is the day after the Sabbath attached to Passover. Okay, you're going to like this. It's a good, good to accept this position, okay? So, you know, like 98%. So the day after the Sabbath is always Sunday, unless you're confused and you think Sunday is the Sabbath. It's the Lord's Day. It's not the Sabbath. So Sunday is the day after the Sabbath. So I believe, and you can read my chapter on the Gospel of John, you'll see. <laughs> I believe that Jesus died on Passover, which made it Friday, and then he spent part of, part of a day and a night in the grave. That's, I know, the sticking point, but Jews don't have any problem with it because we have so many things that are supposed to take days, and there are rabbinic debates about how, how much of a day is a day? And the rabbis always come up with any part of a day is, part, is a day, okay? If you don't want to accept that, that's okay. Try and figure it out for yourself then, okay? <laughs> so I believe Jesus died on Friday. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he rose on Sunday, which was the festival of first fruits because like the wave offering in the temple, he was the first fruit from among the dead. And we are the rest of the harvest. Okay? Now, as soon as you wave that sheaf before the Lord, and say, and really what it means is, we've got one now, Lord. We need more, you know? <laughs> so it's, 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 a thank, it's a thank you and, and, and an act of faith, you know? And then immediately we start counting down 49 days. And on the 50th day, we celebrate what the text would tell us is Shavuot. Shavuot is the word for sevens, because there is no word for week. It's just seven, okay? And so we count seven sevens, 49 days, and on that 50th day, which the Greeks and the Romans called Pentecost, you observe that 50th day. Jewish people just don't use that word. And so it's Shavuot. So on the 50th day, according to Scripture, we are to take two loaves of leavened bread 
and present them to the priests at the temple. And of course, those two loaves come from a common one sheaf in the, in the mindset of Scripture. And so the one sheaf has given us at least two loaves, which again are symbolic of the rest of the harvest. And they're leavened. Now, there's a lot of symbolism that you can take from the two loaves coming from the one sheaf. But in this, because we do not have it absolutely clear in Scripture, uh, let's just say uh, Mitch's opinion is. Okay? And so, coincidentally, I'm sure, the Holy Spirit came on that 50th day. You believe in coincidences, don't you? It was Passover when Jesus died, coincidence. It was first fruit when he rose, definitely coincidence. It's Pentecost and Shavuot when the Holy Spirit came, an accident of time. Okay? So we know that these festivals were even railroad tracks on which the message of the gospel rolled into history. And so the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. Why? Because you had the birthday of the church. Jews and Gentiles coming from the same sheaf. Isn't that a lovely picture? Now, we know the church was born on Pentecost, and so I think it works pretty well. Uh, the rabbis tell us that on the day of Pentecost, every Jew who ever lived in any age were all gathered on Mount Sinai, listening to the giving of the law, the Torah, in their own language. And it came with signs and wonders. If you read the account in Exodus, you see smoke coming from the mountain, right? Fire coming from the mountain. What happened on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem? Tongues as of fire resting on the head of the disciples. Um, every Jewish person should have figured it out that whatever message was now coming had the same authority as Sinai or more. And so Shavuot is packed with messianic meaning absolutely packed. Now, that was quick, so we're going to move to the fall. So, look at verse 33. Now, you want me to talk about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We don't have much time, but take my word for it on Rosh Hashanah. We blow the trumpet, and in a future day, before the Lord returns, we're going to blow another trumpet, okay? So, if you hear it, put your arms up. Okay. When I was a young believer, I read this in the Bible, and uh, I, was, I got saved in Northern California and went back to New Jersey where uh, my family was living, and, where, and I was going to go to Bible college. And for some reason, my, my parents didn't want to put me through to be a missionary to the Jews. I don't understand <laughs> what, what was wrong with them. And so I got a job roofing for a friend of mine, now, the only Jew you want on your roof is Fiddler. So, so I was roofing. I was roofing. This is an aside, okay? So I was roofing, and, and I looked out, and it was getting late. You, don't, you really should not roof in the dark. But, I, I, but I, I looked out, and it was pretty dark. We were young. And I saw these lights glowing, and there was this person you know, hanging between heaven and earth, you know, and I just, I, I, I was, I, I couldn't even speak, and I told my friend to come, come look, come look, you know, and, and he's just cracking up, and he, he, he looks out, and he, sa he looks at me, and he says, he says, take another look, and so I took another look, and unfortunately, it was Jesus on top of the public library <laughs> lit up at night, <laughs> but it wasn't Jesus, some other person, okay? Uh, but uh, we expect uh, the Lord uh, to return, don't we? We want to be on a rapture hair trigger, uh, waiting for the Lord uh, to return. Okay, let's, uh, so if you hear the trumpet, just throw your arms up, okay? 
because you never know. Um, don't be caught sleeping. Uh, the Day of Atonement, if you really want to know about the Day of Atonement, look at Leviticus 23, but read Leviticus 16. Because in Leviticus 16, we have all the details of the Day of Atonement. So, okay, so maybe the, the spring feasts look forward to the first coming, the fall feasts look forward to the second coming, and I think there is probably some wisdom to that. Uh, but we, we have to talk a little bit about the Day of Atonement and why that might be true. Um, because we believe one day there's going to be a national day of atonement for Israel, and you just studied Romans chapter 11, so you know that the apostle Paul, Rabbi Saul, wrote about a great day coming when all Israel will be saved. And we'll actually look at that a little bit in a moment in the course of Tabernacles. All right, so in verse 33 through 36, we have the final festival, which we're now observing, and that's the Feast of Sukkot, or Tabernacles, which lasts for seven days, and then an eighth day, and then a ninth day. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the 15th of the seventh month, you notice three festivals in the seventh month, which is why Jewish people look at the seventh month as the holiest month of the year. On the 15th of the seventh month is the Feast of Booth, that's Sukkot, for seven days to the Lord. On the first day is a holy convocation, okay, just like the Sabbath and the other holidays. You shall do no laborious work of any kind. Again, similar, right? Don't work. For seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. Okay, that's, that was worship. So you see, nothing different than the other holidays. On the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation and present an offering by fire to the Lord. It is an assembly. You shall do no laborious work. But then things get a little bit different. On exactly the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the crops of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord for seven days with a rest on the first day and a rest on the eighth day. This is the restatement of the festival. But there's more detail, and here it is. Now, on the first day, you shall take for yourselves the foliage of beautiful trees, palm branches and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. So this is sort of Philippians comes to Leviticus. So we are commanded to rejoice. It's the only holiday we're commanded to rejoice, which is a marked difference from Rosh Hashanah and the blowing of the shofar and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which are very sober, somber holidays. You shall thus celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a perpetual statue throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. So the key there is taking these three branches, which we sort of weave together, and then we take a big lemon, which we all think is from Israel, but they're usually grown in Cyprus. And if you go on the streets of Brooklyn right now, it's like it, there are open markets because our Messianic Center is in the heart of one of the most Orthodox Jewish areas in, in the world, really. And and they have open markets where they're selling booths and they're selling what we call lulav and esrog. Lulav is the, is the uh, three, the banded three uh, leaves and the esrog is the big lemon. And you have table after table where you go and you negotiate for your lulav and esrog. And, uh, and so the one distinction of tabernacles is this. And one of the reasons, of course, is because it is the final harvest festival and it is a time when we pray for rain. Can you imagine? Did you know that Jewish people in the synagogue services over the last couple of days were marching around carrying these branches and lemons, <laughs> singing Hoshienu, 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 Lord save us, and praying for rain. That's weird, huh? But th that's, that's what we do. And uh, it's very important. So number one, to, to uh, remind us that to obey what God told us to do, but to remind us that it's the final harvest season. And Lord, as you've given us rain and we have the fruit to prove it, Lord, don't forget to bring us the rain next time around. 
Uh, but there's also something else that's very unique. And that is, you shall live in booths for seven days. All the native born in Israel shall live in booths so that your generations may know that I had the sons of Israel live in booths when I brought them out from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And we call these sukkah booths, which, by the way, is saying it twice. Because the sukkah, it means booth in Hebrew. <laughs> but you'll see Jewish people will do it all the time. And these sukkah booths are very interesting. Number one, no nails. Uh, you're, supposed to st you're supposed to sleep in there and live there. Number two, or if, if you're not that religious, you have to eat your meals there. And if you're not that religious, at least you have to visit there. And if you're really not religious at all, well, maybe a synagogue down the street will have one and you can go pop in, okay? And they're beautifully decorated with hanging fruit and all sorts of things. And uh, uh, they have to have an open top because you have to be able to see the stars. Now, this is the fall. It rains in the fall, okay? And so that open top is precarious. And so make sure you bring an umbrella to the sukkah booth. That's all I can say. Now, uh, in Brooklyn, we put them, uh, we, some of us have front yards, but not like you have yards if you happen to have a yard, okay? They're little yards. Uh, so this is a sukkah booth, which is put uh, on a uh, front porch. This is a bigger sukkah booth put on a front, front porch. This is a sukkah booth that is put, who knows where that is, but in front of the house. My favorites are all the sukkah booths on all of the fire escapes in New York, and particularly in Brooklyn, because most people in New York City like in Israel, live in apartment buildings. So where in the world do you build a sukkah booth? Well, on your fire escape. <laughs> and it's very convenient because you can go right out from your home into your sukkah booth, and bring your food out there and sit on your fire escape and then go in. It's a very interesting lifestyle. Now let's see if this works. walking around the neighborhood called Borough Park in Brooklyn, which is a very, very uh, significant Orthodox uh, enclave. And uh, you can see behind me is one of the uh, school buses that take kids to the yeshiva every day. And then uh, as I'm walking along here, you can see that there's some uh, kosher pizza. And then uh, down there is one of the sukkah booths. And uh, they used to be all made with wood and even palm branches on top, but now you can get uh, nice sukkah booth kits, okay? Now I'm walking down uh, this way, and of course unique to uh, Brooklyn and New York City uh, are apartments, and in this area you have a lot of small apartment houses. And apartment houses are great because you can build a sukkah booth like this one again. You can build a sukkah booth on your fire escape. And so there you can see some sukkah booths on fire escapes. And you see one there, one there, another one up there. And then if you cross the street, you see a number of them right over there. And remember, sukkah booths cannot be made with with nails and you've got to have space so that you can see the stars and the sukkah booth reminds you of the frailty of life and, and uh, of God's watch care over our souls. And so you can see all of those uh, over there. And so if you enjoyed your brief little tour of Brooklyn at Tabernacles. I could stand in the middle of the street and do that is because it was Tabernacles. <laughs> and the only people that were driving were heathens, you know, of some sort. <laughs> it's, it, it's, like, it's like Jerusalem on the Sabbath, you know, and, and if you go with Jeff to Israel, you'll, you'll, you'll see exactly what I mean. And so 
that is your introduction to uh, uh, sukkah booths. Now, uh, there are a lot of wonderful lessons from the Feast of Tabernacles, which I love as a believer. Uh, number one lesson is we learn about the frailty of life. God gave us these booths to live in the wilderness, to protect us from the elements, and, but they were very frail. Uh, one wind, and it, they were down. And so we're reminded of the frailty of these sukkah booths that we live in. Secondly, we're reminded of his sufficiency, that even though we are frail, he is strong. And so we know that the Lord takes care of us, and it wasn't an easy 40 years. I mean, personally, I was not there, but it's part of my history. And so it wasn't an easy 40 years, but God did take care of us in the wilderness. And of course, Jewish people will then say, and as we walk through the wilderness of this life, in these frail sukkah booths, God will take care of us here as well. And that's, that's the beautiful thing about the Jewish holidays. Uh, God knows us so well. He knows that we need to, we're tactile, we need to touch things and and taste them, and, and so he gave us so many wonderful ways of understanding his truth through experiencing it through what we can touch and what we could see, and which is why the Jewish holidays are so good for children, whatever age they are. And uh, third lesson is joy unspeakable. Um, there's just, you know, after Rosh Hashanah, and the 10 days of repentance, and the fasting on the Day of Atonement, let me tell you, we break out in joy <laughs> on, on Sukkot. And you might ask me, as a Jewish believer, am I obligated to the Torah, to the law, and therefore I must keep all these festivals? Well, the answer is no. The answer is I, I choose to. And the reason I choose to is it keeps me in the same rhythm as my family in the Jewish community, which for me is very important, because I'm still Jewish. But also, I learned so many lessons about God by observing these festivals. And of course, the last one is the promise of his presence. Now, a few more lessons about uh, tabernacles. Don't worry, when I see 8.30, I'm just going to stop wherever I am. So. Uh, unless Jeff gives me another hour, then we'll study the Book of Romans too. So, you know, <laughs> it's fine with me. God's concern, this is not scripture, just want to read it. God's concern for the Gentiles evident in the Talmudic writings regarding Sukkot. In Jewish sources, Israel's role in world redemption was thought to be a major theme of the Feast of Tabernacles. The rabbis suggest that the 70 bullocks offered on the last day of the feast correspond to the 70 nations of the world, and therefore on Sukkot, the nation of Israel offered sacrifices on behalf of the Gentiles. It's very important to understand about uh, Sukkot. Jewish people understand that from the book of Zechariah, as we will now look at it, Sukkot is the holiday for the Gentiles where Jewish people are reminded of God's call at Sinai for us to be a nation of priests. In Exodus 19, 4 and 5, well, priests for who? Well, for the nations of the world. That makes sense because Isaiah said we were to be his witnesses. He said that we were to be a light to the nations. Abraham was told that the Jewish people were not chosen for their own sake, but the Jewish people were chosen to bless the world. And we understand this from the, from the vantage point of the New Testament. We have incredible understanding of what God has done because through the Jewish people has come the scriptures, both the Old and the New Testaments. And through the Jewish people has come our blessed Messiah. But it's also it also goes further because through the end time repentance of the Jewish people, we will then experience the second coming of the Messiah who will establish his kingdom in Jerusalem and the Gentiles will all, who are faithful and who follow Jesus, will all 
be allowed to come and join us. It's going to be a great day. Now, this end time repentance, of course, is beautifully explained by Rabbi Saul in Romans 11, 25 and following. But, you know, Rabbi Saul probably, I guess, he must have read the book of Zechariah. And so in Zechariah chapter 12, verses 9 through 10, we have uh, an end time scene. And uh, timing wise, I believe this is about one minute to 12, maybe 30 seconds before 12, midnight. We're right on the precipice of the second coming in Zechariah chapter 12. And so the prophet says, in that day, I will set about to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Which means the Jews will be back in Israel, back in Jerusalem, and believe it or not, and I know you're going to find this hard to believe, the Jews will be back in Jerusalem, they'll have the land of Israel, and there will be people surrounding them who don't want them there. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. And these nations will threaten Israel, but God can't allow these nations to destroy his chosen people because he's not done with the Jewish people at all. There's still lots to do. And so God, by his spirit, will intervene in the way he always intervenes. Watch what happens. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem again. After This had to happen after 1967 because we, Jews didn't have Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced. You want to take a guess as to who that is? And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. So in other words, at that very last moment when the nation surrounding Israel, the enemies of Israel, are about to destroy the Jewish people, God will intervene as he always intervenes, and that is through his Spirit. In chapter 4, Zechariah said, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It's not as if God is now going to send down heavenly IDF angels or a, a new type of missile. He sends what is more powerful than any bomb, missile, or army all put together a million times over. He sends his spirit. And his spirit works in the heart of that end time remnant and turns them so that they look to the one who was pierced. And mourning breaks out. Repentance breaks out. So you know that something spiritually dramatic has happened in the souls of the Jewish people. And the Jewish people repent and mourn and cry and recognize that Jesus really was the Messiah. And I think what we're looking at here is the Old Testament portrait of what Paul was describing in Romans 11.25. And then what happens afterwards? Okay, there we go. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured. The houses plundered, the women ravished, and half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fights on a day of battle. So this continues the description of what's going on in chapter 12. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. I'm so glad that I don't spiritualize or allegorize the Bible. What God says through his prophets, he means. And when it says that the feet of Jesus will stand on the Mount of Olives, you can bet as sure as the Savior came, 
born of a Jewish virgin, lived a perfect life, died for our sins, rose from the dead, ascended unto heaven, and said he's going to come back in the same way, and he will return to the Mount of Olives in all of his glory and conquer the enemies of Israel. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move to the north and the other half towards uh, the south. I was uh, with a group of, of young pastors walking on the southern steps. Again, if you go with Jeff, you'll see it. And we were on the southern steps right past the baptismal pools. And we, so we walked up the southern steps, which is probably the oldest and most authentic part of, that, of, the, of the area. And if, if you look to your right, you see a beautiful, it used to be an intercontinental hotel, on the top of the Mount of Olives. And as I was walking up with this young pastor, I said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, you know, you see that hotel over there? He said, yeah. I said, which side do you think those rooms are going to be on? What about those rooms? Because we believe this to be true. The Jewish people will repent and turn to Jesus, and because the Jewish people turn to Jesus, Jesus will return. That's what's going to happen. And in that day, the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one, and his name will the only one. And then, boy, look at the great joy the Gentiles have. Man, this is, this is really a kick. You don't even have to build the sukkah booth. <laughs> then it will come. It's the one thing where Jews can't call a Gentile to build it for them. It's a Jewish joke. Okay. <laughs> Then it will come about that any who are left of all the nations that went against Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to celebrate the Feast of Booths. How much clearer can you get? The Lord has returned. He's reigning on his throne. We're celebrating Sukkot. It's a time of great joy. And the Gentiles are all welcome to come in, eat our fruit, enjoy themselves, and dance the horror with their Jewish friends. Amen. And it will come about that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem, the King, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. So there will be judgment even at that time. Just to go back. Now, if their transgression be riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more will the fulfillment be, Paul writes? For if their rejection be the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? That's what we're looking for on that great day. And then, of course, afterwards, Technology is great. It's the people that, are, you know, just. <laughs> and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he would dwell among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed Away. I believe after a thousand year reign of Christ on his rightful throne in Jerusalem, that tabernacle will pass and an eternal tabernacle will come. And God will dwell with his people forever. You know, we have a bright future. It's hard to remember. That's why we need to get out there and preach the gospel. We not only have, think about it, we not only have salvation now, eternal life. Our lives have been turned upside down and transformed, and God has given us nothing but goodness. I know every one of us walked in the door tonight with some kind of challenge or problem. 
maybe yours, maybe a child's, maybe a parent's. Who knows? We know that, but you can trust the Lord for it. We taste and see that the Lord is good. But we haven't seen anything yet. So if you enjoy your salvation not now, imagine what it's going to be like in the kingdom. And then imagine what it's going to be like when he wipes every tear from our eyes. I'm telling you, if you're not a believer in Jesus tonight, you really want to think about it. And Paul writes in Romans 11, 11, I say then they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? May it never be, but by their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. If the end time repentance of the Jewish people is so important, then don't you think that we should all do something about telling Jewish people about Jesus? Okay, I've got five minutes. I'm not quitting. Okay. All right, you can open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In John, chapter 1, we read a very interesting passage. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Greek word there is the translation of the Hebrew word, which means to tabernacle. And we beheld his glory, glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. I think you could really miss the point of tabernacles unless you understand Jesus in tabernacles. Uh, one last point about uh, the festivals of Israel that I think is critical. If you think of the festivals of Israel as a setting, a jewelry setting, and think of Jesus as the jewel, then you'll understand what I see. When Jesus, the Jewish Messiah for all, is placed in his Jewish setting through the festivals of Israel, he shines all the brighter. It's spectacular. And so the word became flesh and tabernacled among us and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten Father, from the Father full of grace and truth. So we understand that uh, his body was his tabernacle, and you know, <laughs> even his flesh couldn't hide his glory from those who were willing to see it. But that's not all he did. Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, was the, probably the oldest son in his family, and therefore, because he was the oldest son in his family, it would be his obligation to go from the Galilee to Jerusalem three times a year for the great Jewish festivals, Passover, Pentecost, Shavuot, and Tabernacles. Those are the three aliyah feasts. Aliyah, because you always go up when you go to Jerusalem. It means to go up. And so it would have been Jesus' obligation to go to the Feast of Tabernacles on behalf of his family. And... Uh, I, I see in John chapter 7, Jesus playing a game of chicken uh, with those who were opposing him. He's coming. No, he's not. I'm going. No, I'm not going. And it's not because he was afraid for his life. I think he was afraid because they may have made him a king, and that would have messed things up. And so in John chapter 7, uh, near the end, Just looking at verse 32. The Pharisees heard the multitude muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Jesus therefore said, For a little while I am with you, then I go to him who sent me. You shall seek me, and you shall not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews, whenever John uses the Jews in a negative sense, he's referring to those Jews who are against Jesus. And the reason I know that is because Jesus is Jewish and John was Jewish. So just think about that. So the Jews against Jesus, who is a, new, a new, new, new club, therefore said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we shall not find him? He's not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? 
What is the statement? You shall seek me and will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. And so Jesus was in and out of the feasts, speaking mysteries, being elusive, and until the seventh day. The seventh day is called Hoshana Rabbah, the great day of the feast. On that great day, the priests and the Levitical choir and the Levitical band and many followers went down to the Pool of Siloam with huge urns, filled them with living water, marched back to the temple, and poured the water at the base of the altar. And as they did that, they cried out, Hoshienu, Hoshienu, Lord, save us, Lord, save us. Even at that time, the rabbis understood that the pouring out of the water was a reminder of the pouring out of the Spirit in Joel chapter 2 in the last days. And so that is what they would have had in their mind. And there was a cacophony of noise. Uh, the band was playing. The choir was singing. There were thousands of people marching, shouting Hoshienu, Hoshienu. You could barely hear yourself think. Here's what happened. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Yeshua stood and cried out. He had to or else he wouldn't have been hurt. If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of law, living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so on that last day of the feast, when they were pouring out the water, symbolizing the Spirit, symbolizing the coming of the one who would pour out the Spirit in the last days. It was viewed as a messianic passage, Joel chapter 2. And so the expectation at that moment was that one day the Messiah would come, pour out the Spirit. And in a sense, Jewish people would never spiritually thirst again. And in the middle of it, Jesus came and he cried out. And they weren't expecting him. And he said, come to me and drink. And when we come to him and drink, we recognize that he is at the center of Sukkot. In fact, he's at the center of every Jewish festival. And when we come to him, and take what he has to give us by faith, then our souls will be satisfied as never before. Chag Sameach. Happy Sukkot. Happy holiday. It's truly happy for you and for me when we know the one whom to know is life eternal. When we know the one whom every great festival of Israel points to and is the fulfillment. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and grace. We love you because you first loved us. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, I pray because I, I think, Lord, tonight there are some people here whose souls are, are thirsty, who have never come to know your son, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would work in their hearts tonight. Open them, Lord, and cause them to reach out to you in faith and to accept you as their Lord, their King, their Messiah, so that they have joy today and unspeakable joy tomorrow. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen.